Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Please, say, uh, please wave your hand if you can hear me. Can you hear me, everyone? Hi. Hello, good morning. Hey, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I'm the director of international panel, uh, international relations panel, and my name is Woody, and I'm a doctoral student at Oxford. It is my great honor to introduce you our distinguished speakers. First, um, let's welcome Dr. Susan Yang. Dr. Dr. Susan Yang. Uh, Dr. Susan Yang is lecturer in Chinese public governance and international relations and at King's Lao China Institute and founding director for the Chinese Governance Innovation Research Center. Her book on uh, her book, China in UN Security Council on Iraq remains one of the best, offering powerful explanations about China's international organizational behavior. Now let's welcome uh, Michael Liu, Liu Yiqiang, Mr. Liu Yiqiang. <laughs> Mr. Liu Yiqiang is a lawyer and a very visionary civil society leader from China. In uh, 2012, he founded the NGO Chinese Initiative on International Law, which is, only, uh, which is the only NGO of its kind that functions actively and openly within China and has an office overboard, which is in Hague, the Hague. And the organization has been involved in uh, Syrian refugees' uh, relief work. Previously, he was a victim's counsel at the extraordinary chamber uh, in the courts of Cambodia, and worked at the International Criminal Court, International Committee uh, of Red Cross, and the private law firm Fonda Partners under various capacities. Uh, let's welcome Professor Ranamita. <laughs> Professor, Professor Ranamita is the uh, currently director of uh, University of Oxford China Centre, and he is also a professor uh, of the history and politics uh, of modern China. He is a fellow of the British Academy. He is one of the best uh, scholars. Uh, he is one of the best scholars in the China School uh, with uh, China School of with Japan, uh, against Japan, and his book, uh, The Forgotten Ally, China's Second World War, uh, has won, uh, won the Duke of Westminster Medal for Military Literature. And let's welcome Professor Ranamita. Now, the panel, the panel runs in uh, three sections. The first one will be, uh, our speakers will give, uh, okay. Our speakers will give a very short speech, and then they will have a very nice conversation among themselves. And then there will be a very short Q&A session. Now, let's welcome Dr. Yang. Um, thank you, Steve, for your very generous introduction. I'm very happy to be back here. I was in Oxford about 11 years, and then went on to London. And it's very good to be back here. Faces which look familiar to me. So, but anyway, today, because we are having about five ten minutes, I understand. So, I will make a few remarks. Okay, I will not make a sort of a, a pedantic speech uh, or seminar type, but I will share some insights. So what I'll be talking about, uh, it, first of all, is uh, the conception of a community of uh, shared future for uh, humankind, and I will relate that conception uh, to the policy strategy of Belt Road Initiative. And then I'll talk a little bit about, about, uh, about the regional order and the world order, which are, um, in a way, uh, underpinned, if you like, by the set of uh, under understanding or conception in the Chinese mind. What I will do is actually uh, take a sort of what we call inside out approach in international relations. And then I'll step back, do a little bit outside in, and to see uh, you know, is, if there's any disparities and why there are some. And uh, finally, I'll offer a few remarks about uh, um, what the world can do uh, to Chinese sort of conceptions and its practice uh, as enshrined in the uh, ideas of uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, if we all know the conception of the community of a shared future for humankind, uh, it's actually written in the 19th um, Party Congress report. 
and it's written in the constitution, the party constitution, together with um, the ideas of Belt Road Initiative. Um, I, I'm not going to you know, say too much about what it is, but I can offer an overview of the context in which this concept has been mentioned over the last um, five, ten years. Okay. I think my first uh, point would be that it's, nothing, it's not entirely new concept. It's a concept which has uh, demonstrated the continuity in Chinese foreign policy thinking. Here are some quick uh, um, uh, snapshots. Um, the first one was the uh, ideas just mentioned was in 2007 by uh, then President Hu Jintao. It was referred in the context of uh, cross-Taiwan street relations. And later on, the concept was uh, invariably used to refer to uh, regional um, uh, relations. So China's relations with South China countries, uh, South China countries, and uh, um, of course, then in 2011, September, China issued the white paper on China's peaceful development. Um, that, that was done by the Information Office of the Council, um, in which the new perspective of a community of common destiny uh, to seek the new connotation of common interests and values uh, was um, uh, kind of announced. So it has since uh, been frequently referred to, mainly in the context of regional and the neighboring countries. Uh, for instance, um, in 2012, uh, Hu Jintao uh, at that time mentioned it in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in June uh, 2012. But then in 2012, uh, 18th National Congress of the CCP, the concept was used to note that this world, I quote, this world, the degree of interaction and the interdependence among countries are unprecedentedly depended. So all peoples are living in the same earth village. And you can see in the language the reference to globalization and the, the idea of uh, a small village where all humankind share some common um, challenges and opportunities. Um, so the Chinese idea promoted then was to formulate what's called a community of common destination in which we are all among uh, the idea, the, the sort of Chinese uh, words were, we are among you and you are among us. This sort of, uh, this line of uh, thinking um, is, I mean, continued has continued, is continuing, continuous in Xi Jinping's, uh, you know, um, thinking, particularly foreign policy thinking. This was seen in um, 2013, for instance, uh, when he visited Africa in March, um, gave also later on when he gave a talk at the Boao Forum. Um, of course, in uh, the same year, in October 2013, during his visit to <coughs> ASEAN countries, he issued the same uh, share the same idea. Um, in Beijing, 2013, October 25th, she also particularly stressed letting the awareness of, communi uh, of community of common destiny take a root in the neighboring countries. Again, uh, until 2013, you can see the idea, the conception was mainly um, referred to in the context of uh, neighboring countries uh, relations. Now, in September 2015, she proposed uh, the roadmap for building a community of shared future for all humankind at the United Nations Summit. That's January 2015. And this, he further um, expounded this sort of idea in um, a more comprehensive manner at the UN office in Geneva. Um, following that, in 2015 16, uh, President Xi has referred to the community of common destiny or the um, community, a community of shared future for all humankind, invariably 60 times, 40 uh, or more. And eventually, of course, as we mentioned at the beginning, it was written into 
uh, the uh, 19th con Party Congress report. So what I'm um, trying to, well, I'm, I'm adding actually, there's really a continuity in foreign policy thinking because sometimes uh, observers, commentators outside China may find these new terms quite baffling, wondering uh, why we talked about you know, peaceful rise, peaceful development, and a harmonious world, a harmonious society. Now altogether is another new uh, uh, concept. What are the relations of this? But if you break this down, you can see uh, there's a sort of inner logic in the Chinese foreign policy thinking, which uh, increasingly more, I would argue, emphasize on um, a degree of uh, global reach, I mean, universality in a sense. They want to use very common language, nothing like a political theoretical concept. They want to talk about human destination or shared future uh, in a very sort of practical term. Uh, sense. I mean, to say, okay, we are in this, we have been faced with all sorts of challenges. There's been this financial crisis, and this sort of uh, uh, stagnation of economic development, and also uh, the, the, the vacuum, if you like, created by Trump's uh, um, uh, regime uh, since his election. So China, you can argue, in many ways, um, did see or does still see a very good opportunity for it to take uh, uh, to play a more important or increasingly more active uh, role in international relations, particularly in global governance, I, I would argue. There's, there's our evidence, you see uh, Xi Jinping's talk in, um, um, in the uh, Bo'ao, but later on, um, yes, in, in Geneva, um, in Davos, yes, and uh, of course, you can there's a clear, very clear, clear line in Chinese narrative. I want to now make the secondary remark about how uh, the conception is related to uh, BRI. Am I doing well on time? The BRI? Three minutes, okay. The BRI, of course, uh, we all know that it connects uh, through more than a thousand miles of railways, connects the a huge landmass of Eurasia, and it, it, it has two, right? You all know it's, uh, it's a belt uh, in the landmass, and also the 21st uh, Maritime Silk Road uh, uh, connecting ports uh, in South China Sea in Indian Ocean uh, to Africa. Um, the BRI is often dubbed as sort of uh, empty, hollow concept or umbrella, which you, uh, awaits being filled in with concrete plans. But if you actually look at uh, the uh, government uh, um, or official documents, of course, you can see the, uh, particularly the one issued in 2015 and later on by the State Council, uh, uh, Ministry of Commerce and uh, the National Committee of uh, Reform, Development Reform. Uh, they, there's a very uh, interesting detailed plans about that. And the, ta uh, the attachment, the great importance the central government attached to this uh, policy strategy is unprecedented. If you look at uh, uh, the four uh, member who, uh, who formed the leader, top leaders, and it was actually, as you know, the vice prime minister uh, who was the uh, head of the small uh, group uh, leading this program. I was uh, in Beijing in January when I interviewed a number of officials and scholars and talked with uh, various practitioners who are involved with BRI. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's going, it's ongoing, it's on everyone's sort of mind. You can see, um, probably it's not a grand strategy, I would argue it's uh, part of a grand strategy in the making. That brings me to the third uh, main point <coughs> I'd like to mention here, it's about uh, to what extent you can see from the conception of a community of uh, this uh, shared um, future for all humankind, the all common destiny, and the practice of BRI, to what extent you can see a more emerging sort of concept of world order, if not world order, but regional order, to what extent it's taking shape, I, I would argue you can see. Now, that brings me to the sort of final uh, uh, remarks about what would be the nature of such an order. So there are worries, particularly in Europe and in America, talking about okay, China being uh, China, uh, one party, so on and so forth. How could it actually uh, help you know, promote or uh, being a major player in the essentially liberal international order? Um, 
I think I would suggest that uh, not necessary to put any sort of ism, liberalism, or whatever Marxism in in the black uh, in the sort of uh, brackets. Uh, what I would like to uh, focus is actually looking at the mechanisms and also languages, Chinese ofi uh, official statements, and the top leaders have been um, using. If you look at the substance instead of you know the sort of labels, you will see. Actually, there's not much uh, difference from the previous um, very engaging attitudes towards international order. I mean, I know the order we're talking about is, is changing. Um, so it, it, there's no clear sign for me to say that China is replacing uh, the existing order with something else. Because if you look at all the reports and official uh, statements, you realize that uh, what they have been talking about is pretty much engaging their order. They will be, or they are, they have been the, the strongest supporter of the uh, existing order. But having said that, there are elements, there are elements about to what extent the Chinese indigenous or you know, traditional sort of philosophical concepts might be, um, you know, utilized in a more frequent current way or in, in, sub in substantial way, if you like. Uh, how compatible or how uh, to what extent those ideas can be integrated into what the mainstream international, uh, you know, analysts, uh, uh, the, the sort of current order is ongoing, that remains to be seen. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. <laughs> Let's welcome Mr. Liu. Thank you, Woody. I do want to thank you and uh, the organizing committee again for inviting me. Uh, even the weather is not the most prime, but I think we have a Chinese sage in Rishu, Zhao Fengye. So that uh, shows you know, we're in a very auspicious <laughs> atmosphere, I think, at least. Um, a little bit of introduction about myself. I was a lawyer working in the international tribunals in Southeast Asia and also in Europe. Because of that experience, I found the active role of this civil societies or the NGOs around the globe, and there is not much Chinese uh, role or um, Chinese organizations doing that. So I had the idea with a couple of my friends funded the first legal or the organization working on international law, the NGO called Chinese Initiative on International Law, and now we have office in Europe as Woody has introduced. So my engagement, my intervention here is really as an ordinary lawyer who are working from the civil society perspective, what my take or what our organizations or our communities takes on this concept of a community of shared future. Um, really, what the Chinese people, ordinary citizens like me, how do we want to define the term in the future? I will start with something nerdy, something nerdy quote I found on my way here. Um, the Oxford Handbook of Modern Diplomacy has um, introduced that the civil society organizations are most important at the beginning and the end of the global diplomatic efforts. Well, that's from the Western, I think, very classic, classic uh, Western perspective on the role of the civil society in a democratic constitutional rule of law society. But that's not to say that it does not have a role or has not, no echo in the Chinese um, academia or systems. The dean of the School of International Relations of Peking University, Professor Wang Yuzhou, in his article, Civil Society and China's Public Diplomacy, has once asserted that national components and their change will play a determining role in China's perspective to its foreign policy. Well, this is a very renowned uh, scholar in China and allegedly one of the state masters, Guo Shijibie. I think um, his assertion very much can educate on um, what the state is thinking of um, the role of civil societies in the global arenas. So indeed, what is the significance of NGOs growing participation in the global affairs, the Chinese NGOs participation in the global affairs, in the shaping of China's future diplomatic engagement in the area of a community of shared future? Well, we go from the assertion, the series, to the reality. The reality is that the policy on the ground, even though I know that in the West, much of the reports on the NGOs, if you Google, is on the, in a way, almost notorious foreign NGO control law. But that's not the whole picture, I can assure you. 
because we have an office in The Hague, I have to, have to deal with that law all the time. But there are also other um, state policies of all kinds now in, in the forum. This thinking is that from the Mao era to now, is always that we have to clean the room and invite the guest. So right now is already cleaning the rooms. And who are the guests to invite? Who are the NGOs to be in play in China in the future? The policy says from the state that there will be more Chinese social organizations, the term equivalent to the term NGOs in the West. There will be more social organizations going out. And in the confidential documents, it all stated that there should be more Chinese social organizations to join the alliance, the coalitions of international NGOs. And you heard the terms of the people-to-people -people, people -to -people bond. And there's a new grand South-to-South -South Development Foundation setting up. You see, there's all kinds of policies encouraging more Chinese civil societies going abroad and doing more things and taking over the world in a way. But what about these things on the ground? What about these things in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America? I have an interesting example. I was in Jordan last week, a former European colony, a proud colony of Great Britain, <laughs> the only one being spared from the armed conflict in the Middle East now, with all the neighboring countries, Palestine, Syria, and Iraq fighting the wars. Jordan is like a peace oasis there. Because it's not fighting the war, and because it's accepting large amounts of refugees, one of the largest uh, number, millions of refugees now in Jordan, the, always, um, the foreign diplomatic agenda is always about finding the aid to help these refugees and other um, terminal, people in turmoil. One third of its GDP is actually based on the foreign aid. If we look into the numbers, the United States is giving to this country annually 1.3 billion US dollars. Of course, with the Belt and Road Initiative coming, a lot of expectations is given to China. And currently, uh, China is getting more engaged. Even though we look at numbers, it's still small. Last year, there was a few million US dollars. Different from billions, it's still millions. Well, we are very developing states. We still have a large area to cover. We have a poverty population. But I'm saying interesting in that way, when we talk with the state media, when we talk with the journalists there, the Chinese journalists, they say that they only report the news of China giving aid in Arabic language, not in Chinese language, in Arabic language, English language. Why? People in China, like me, have experienced a very unpleasant World Refugee Day last year where the goodwill ambassador of the UNHCR, Ms. Yao Chen, was malicious attacked for her quote, stay with refugees. Not arguing anything else, but only to stay with refugees. There was more than five million attacks on Weibo against her. This, this strategy of um, reporting is very much to avoid unnecessary, unpleasant, unpleasant assertions back from China. So we go back to the very, uh, very much where we started. A state cannot advance one of its agendas with the support, without the support of its people. And that's, that's the role of the civil societies. Everyone agree with that? We as an organization in the common future, a very much community-based volunteer organization, we realize that, and then we started to change. We ask every volunteer we sent to the Middle East, when they go back to China, they have to share their experience with the universities, with the high schools, with the journalists, and with the philanthropy sectors back in China, in a way to create a more genuine and robust civil society engagement in the future. The first of these will be March 21st, which I'm very proud, is a Rhodes finalist who studied a year here in Oxford. She's now, uh, she's from Tsinghua University, and she's going to give a, um, a sharing this month in the Schwarzman College in Beijing. And later on, she will go to study, uh, finish her study in Harvard. I found this is a very much a good example of what we mean by a community of a shared destiny. A Chinese volunteer working in the Middle East, in Lebanon, helping Syrian refugees and share their experience with the rest of the audience in a renowned international college 
in Bactrain. Well, I'm very optimistic on that, but we always need to challenge, are we always right? Is that the right direction or will it work? If it works in a country like we're in now, in the United Kingdom, where you have all kinds of NGOs engaging all kinds of British citizens abroad, which very much we're learning from, how come it still have a Brexit? Still have something going on to the extreme end of isolation, in my view. We don't know what we're doing to engage on the civil society that will help to bring a change. But the change is always unstoppable. I hope with that, I will end up my interventions with another quote. A professor from Harvard University, Len Johnson, asserted in 1999, in his publication, Thoughts on China's Participation in the International System. I think he classically concluded, which I very much agree with that, in the China, in the modern China, state behaviors, market economy, and civil society have a robust dynamic with each other. To understand them in different layers is key to understand the civil society in China and China's diplomacy. I thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Liu. And let's welcome Professor Rana Mita. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, and it's also a very, very hard act to follow two such comprehensive and well put together um, statements about what is important in the here and now about China and its relationship with the wider world and certainly Europe included within that. I'm going to make a few comments and then as our chair knows we're actually going to just encourage a bit of discussion between the members of the panel before we open up to you the audience. Before I do that I just wanted to say I think this is the third or fourth Oxford China Forum that I've been privileged to be invited to and every year it gets larger and better and more uh, deeply integrated with a whole variety of really key questions. I think just looking through the brochure shows what quality of speakers uh, have come this year. I'm quite uh, impressed to have managed to sneak into the, uh, the, uh, the personnel, in fact, and feel suitably privileged, but it's a really great tribute to all the committee who have, uh, have put it together, and that's uh, a huge pleasure to be able to be part of that. I would also say that our chair here, I think, has been doing such a fantastic job so far that I'm going to promote you, rather than having you just be in the limited term of this panel, you shall be, I think, the chair for an unlimited series of terms through this Oxford China Forum and beyond as well. And I'm sure that will suit the new atmosphere that we're moving into in all sorts of, uh, all sorts of ways. Let me find a way to try and bring together some of the points that I think that Suzanne and Michael have made here this morning and connect them actually to one of the things that you said right at the end. You mentioned Brexit. I think it's very difficult to take part in any conversation about international politics in the UK at the moment without that subject coming up. And while I don't want to concentrate on it to the exclusion of other things, we are currently sitting in the UK. The majority of people here are people who are undertaking um, education and courses here in Britain. And I think it is important to try and think about how this country's changing international context interacts with this very fast-moving very important set of changes, both domestically and internationally, that our first two speakers have brought up. So, may I start by putting in perhaps a, a biauti, a kind of political statement, a political phrase that may, I hope, help us to rethink this particular relationship. Uh, up to now, I think, you know, one of the ways in which the Brexit process has been seen is as breaking up the process of ever greater Europeanization, the sort of old the uh, the Guotang. What I'd like to say instead, perhaps borrowing from a great Chinese political thinker of recent years, is that what we have here instead is yo inguo te se de hua. <laughs> In other words, for those few who didn't get that, a uh, Europeanization with British characteristics. In other words, I think it's becoming increasingly clear, whether you supported Brexit or were against it, that actually the relationship that Britain is going to have with the European Union and the outer world will change in some important ways. In other ways, will stay very similar. And I think actually the Prime Minister's speech uh, just you know, a day and a half ago was very, very important in terms of making that point very clearly. And in that sense, 
I want to take it in that spirit to talk about two or three of the areas, or actually two, let's say, to, uh, to get the discussion going, that relate directly to what our two speakers here have said. And I'll use that, if I may, as a way of starting off a discussion between us. The first one is about values. And I think that speaks to what Dr. Yang was talking about here. Talking about a shared community of nations, a shared community that exists within the Asia Pacific, but also, <coughs> I think, beyond that into the wider world, talking also about initiatives like BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, means that we have to start thinking more and more about what shared values are. And one of the words that I keep hearing over and over again in China, but also when I go to Japan, where I was just you know, a couple of weeks ago, in India, uh, and other countries in the region, is that what they most fear is the loss of the current order. In fact, I'll give you a quote, if I may, um, Suzanne, and I'll get you to come back on this in a few minutes, if I may, from a senior Japanese thinker who I was speaking to. He's not a foreign, official, a foreign office official, but he's very close to the foreign ministry, the Gaimosho in Japan. And his phrase was, we like the status quo in Asia. We think it's fabulous. So, you know, that was his direct uh, quote in that case. What people are looking at as China's economic power rises, as the BRI becomes much more of a kind of steadily moving but certainly more integrated process, bringing in some ways a whole variety of other Chinese directed um, uh, economic partnerships, so the RCEP, the Regional Common Economic Partnership, um, the approach, of course, of TTIP minus one, the TTIP is no longer going to have the US in it at the moment, but China's clearly engaged with that from the outside. As these come together, what are the shared values about order that actually come together? How do they relate to observing the status quo in terms of international society? And how do they relate to changes that are emerging? Many will know that many countries, not just China, but including China, are increasing their military <coughs> budgets in the East Asia region. Uh, Japan, of course, is currently strengthening its own self-defense force, but China is currently building up a very substantial military presence in the region and with blue water projection into the Indian Ocean. That's causing India, of course, to react in certain ways that, not at the moment, but certainly potentially in the future, suggest that that order could be disturbed. Now, bringing it back to the UK, one of the things that I think Europe can play an important role in doing, and I'm going to continue to include Britain in this, because one of the other things that the Prime Minister has said is that Britain's role in the security of Europe and security arrangements within Europe is either not going to change or ideally will become even deeper. And I think actually as a way of showing that Britain will continue to be an outward-looking European democracy, in her words, I, I would bet a quite a large amount of money, which I don't have because I'm an <laughs> academic, but if I had the money, I would bet it, on the UK continuing to play a large role in Euro European security conversations. The Asia-Pacific is going to be more part of those. It has to be not least because of the growing economic strength of the region. And therefore, talking about how Britain, as a country separated from the main structures of Europe, but in dialogue with them, will deal both with the needs to build up a trade relationship with China, but also with India and with the other countries of the region, ASEAN, very much in, in the sights there. That is a dilemma which I think we need to start discussing now, because I think it's just in a very incipient, very beginning stage, and it hasn't really been thought through. So hopefully a few minutes this morning can be spent thinking about that. Let me make my second and last point, if I may, uh, with Michael in mind. And I was really heartened to hear you talk about the refugee situation. And I think actually one of the great underplayed stories is the way in which China is becoming involved in transnational and international institutions and efforts in terms of that wider footprint. Now, I was really saddened here. I had heard a version of that story about the fact that domestic reaction to some of that has been in some ways quite hostile, uh, quite negative. And it is almost a sign that the Chinese government is boosting its international position through these organizations while not telling the story at home. I think turning that round <coughs> and beginning to find a way to tell that story is a really important key goal. But let me make the British point again, if I may, in that context. When I've gone round, as I have, talking to friends who work in international relations, uh, in uh, foreign affairs think tanks, in a whole variety of places that are not just China, but also Africa, Asia, and elsewhere, what aspects of Britain's overseas projection do people most respect? 
And you hear a whole variety of things. Uh, one is about you know, culture and soft power. One is what happens right here, higher education, which is an area that I really think we need to be a lot more careful of uh, as, you know, as, as in, uh, in terms of uh, Britain's uh, position going, going forward. And I think anyone working in or studying in higher education would send a warning to the current government that you, you damage it at its peril. Um, broadcasting and media, the BBC, obviously, is part of that. But actually, the one that surprised me most was the word DFID, the Department for International Development. This is something which is, once again, very much, in many cases, under attack from parts of the press and even parts of its own government within the UK. But if you go around the world, Britain's commitment to a very significant fixed portion of its government income being spent on international aid and also the way in which that projects Britain's ability to think beyond immediate transactional trade deals, which of course are very much on people's minds now, and think about the long term, has been deeply impressive. I think it's no accident to say that Britain's contribution in that area is something that has been widely noted in many places around the world. Certainly I speak to many Chinese think tankers who are aware of Diffid's contribution, rather admire it and want to think about how it might be used. So that conversation, which is, broadly speaking, conversation about values, about civilization, about culture, and not just about the immediacy of, of aid and refugee crisis, is another area where I think Brexit Britain rethinking its European relationship is also going to be in a new sort of conversation with the wider world. I don't see that conversation happening in a very deep way <coughs> now. I would want to again start that conversation happening now so that in three, five, ten years when the current turmoil has calmed down one way or another, this country and the countries it engages with, including China, are talking at least to some extent about the same sort of dialogues. We will not always agree about those, I can say that now, but I think we need to be having the same conversation and I think the Oxford China Forum is one outstanding place to start begin, beginning those, uh, those balls rolling, particularly with a generation that I hope in three, five, ten years' time, will be actively part of the dialogue and not simply listening to it. Thank you very much, Woody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mita, for your very generous uh, word, and also thank you very much for promoting me. And I think the committee, the committee should really talk about it. Now, uh, let's have a little discussion about uh, you. And Professor Mita, would you mind start? I will start. do that if I may. So what I'll do is perhaps take for a few minutes um, our panel here and begin perhaps that dialogue starting. And then we've got so many people with so many things to say, I suspect, here. So we'll move quite quickly after that to Q&A with the audience. And I hope that will be very much a, a dialogue rather than uh, just a um, uh, kind of series of, of, of questions. So we'll try and promote that. Let me turn back to you, though, Suzanne. I mean, the word values came up more than once. And a lot of what you were talking about, by the end, you were even talking about Confucian language, traditional language, harmony and so forth being used in Chinese international relations. But there's a problem there, at least there's an issue which I'd like you to deal with, because Confucian language is broad and it doesn't just apply to China, but it is culturally specific. Is it possible, do you think, for us to have a universalist dialogue and shared set of values about international relations while bringing in these culturally specific ideas? How, how would that work? Two, uh, I like to analyze on a sort of three levels. I think it's at the conceptual level, you will realize since the you know, uh, PRC 1949 has tried very hard to engage with international language. In terms of China's engagement with the outside world, it has experienced total isolation during which there was no sort of global universal language at all. So we're talking about Marxism, revolutionary sort of language. And that's that is a sort of global language, of course, uh, uh, Marxism. Of course, you can say, but it's, it's very specific in China, with Chinese characteristics, if you like, but also <laughs> very much limited in that uh, uh, cultural and the political sphere. And if you talk about Chinese engagement since 1970s, particularly since 1980s, you know, being very positive, active, engaged in the international world, standing out to all the international treaties, joining international organizations and so, so forth, you realize the sort of <coughs> universal <coughs> ideas, particularly IR, start to you know, get into the Chinese parlor, political and the intellectual discourse. But they were talking about matching the tracks. We're always, always thinking that we are left behind. We need to catch up, we need to learn. So you, you emphasize the Chinese idea, idea's great capacity of learning. So 
universal. I mean, we talk about the Wang Yizhou and his close co colleagues. My, I mean, he translated the sort of classical IR books in the 1990s into China. That's when the Chinese understand, okay, we talk about realism. Oh, we weren't doing that, actually. We didn't know <laughs> that was that. Uh, that brings me on to say that sort of 2000, then this year, last year, then you do see sort of very clear gesture that China has made a sort of announcement we have arrived eventually. Well, now we are a major power. We're talking about new era of Chinese foreign policy and a new type of international relations. But I think uh, um, I would invite everybody to ponder about how new this sort of idea is. If you look at all the concepts, you break them down. The Chinese didn't, as I said earlier, not use an sort of uh, political theoretical language, which we are very familiar with here, but they do try to engage on the, at least the common sense level. So they shared, these are Confucian la la language. I mean, I know we have a philosopher panel this afternoon. They'll be talking about that. But did do, uh, uh, I have done a little bit of research in this. Um, I think the key here is to look at both the words and the deeds, and also to see to what extent these ideas so do you think those deeds, and uh, as well as the words, are, or rather, are the deeds matching the words? Because you talk about a new type of international relations. Let me throw you back to those words of that Japanese foreign ministry yes. uh, advisor mm. that I was talking about. We like the status quo in Asia. We think it's fabulous. Yes. I was going many, to that. So many yeah. people are, you know, are, are looking at China's rise. It's both economic yeah. and military. Yeah. They see that status quo changing. Yes. Should they be worried? I don't think they should be worried. But even... I mean, everybody can be kind of thinking forward. You can look at the three steps, five steps in the longer term. I think, one, by and large, one can argue China is the largest status quo supporter. Still, so. Even now. Even now, yeah, to, uh, up to a point, I should say. Uh, this being this, um, China has been, uh, if you look at its attitude towards UN, you know, or the framework, existing systems, what they have been doing, you know, it's AIIB or self uh, fund, all this sort of thing. They are meant to be supplementary. They're not necessarily totally replacing. Uh, one can argue, okay, <coughs> IMF, World Bank, their roles are, uh, in a way, not as important as they could be before to China, in a way. But the Chinese argument tend to be, okay, we have never really made the rules. Now we want to participate in the cooperative sort of efforts to make rules, not just by China. If you look at AIB, they have other members from Asia, right? Including the UK. Chinese. Well, the UK, UK as, as well. Definitely. But if you're joining uh, the rules, let's give one specific one. Hmm. China signed up to the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, yeah. but wasn't very pleased with the Hague judgment about South China Sea that's a very That's a very particularly interesting case, because hmm. uh, we had a discussion in 2014, I invited several uh, high sort of uh, PRA Navy generals uh, in, in London, a very, very debate, uh, lively debate with um, leading scholars in Keynes and other, other universities, all about you know, military defense. Uh, they were talking about, okay, this sort of uh, unclose. They had a very specific context. The usual Chinese argument would be uh, it didn't apply to China when there was no concept of sovereignty. But mm. that, that was one line of argument. The others would be, okay, you need to look at the situation specifically, and the China could in helping make, the, you know, the rules, yes, together. So I think if you look at PRI, if you look at the mechanisms, nothing is really settled. I think it's open, it's inviting everybody to participate. I think that's a very, very spirit, the sort of shared future and the common destiny would like to signify for, uh, for the rest of the world. I think um, it's very sensible just to take on this, of course, with your own thinking, understanding, and debate, you know, have dialogue. I think that's the way forward, rather than what probably happened in the, you know, the Munich uh, Security Conference, where the foreign minister of Germany mm -hmm. uh, is mm, making uh, remarks sort of Russia and China. In a way, USA, we're trying to make an effort to break or to separate Europe. I, I guess these cases need to be looked into in very specific ways, and they're not the same at all. And China, in China's case, I would argue, it's actually extending its invitation. And how to engage it, it would be crucial, because in a way, I would say Chinese tend to, well, like many very sensible uh, decision makers, the leaders, they, they, they're very sensitive to a logic of appropriateness, not necessarily a logic of consequence. So they would be reacting to how others you know, treat them. So I think on that note, I would say, I uh, choose to take a very positive 
no to that. Well, we'll see if people in the audience agree, but not before we've turned to you, Michael. Could we turn to what I think was one of the most fascinating parts of what you had to say and drill down into it a little bit more? And that is the way in which China is getting involved with humanitarian efforts abroad. And think about that as part, again, of this question of communities and values that come together. For a very long time, for one very simple reason, China was a developing country that didn't have a huge national income. It wouldn't have been particularly reasonable to expect that China was going to be a very big actor in that world. Now, of course, it's the second biggest economy in the world, may yet become the first biggest economy in the world. And that means that at perhaps rather high speed, China is having to think again about its international role in these sort of areas that have become very much at the forefront of how that international community is, is formed. Could I have a bit more of a sense of you of how much that task is understood and debated and appreciated in China? You know, what's, what's the agenda there, would you say? Okay. Thank you, Rana. Um, I do want to comment a little bit on the Department of International Development you made in your interventions. That, um, there was a rumor before the Shi Jiu Baogao that this Baogao will uh, establish or at least um, proposed the establishment of the Bureau of International Development mm. in the Chinese authorities, but right. he, didn't he didn't realize that uh, in the last one. Now it's the PCC is with the Central Liaison yes. Department, the Communist Party, the Ministry of Commerce, all these things coming here. But I think there is discussion that this international development, international humanitarian system will get more centralized and being handled by our government agency. Very much, in a way, it's uh, going parallel with what you're asking now. How mm. How can we um, observe, what's my take on the, of this progress? Um, I think right now the state agenda, the diplomatic agenda, to my observation, is still very much on the resources, on the safety passage uh, in the South China Sea and in the polar areas. Um, lots of oils, land, rather than so much on people and the values. Sadly, or um, means that we have more potential there. Mm -hmm. um, but I do echo what you're asking about the values of the things. What I found is there's not that much, I would like to see it more, but there's not that much discussions on the values of the international assistance, international humanitarian assistance, the values of it. Um, why we're doing that, and why that is not so different from what we're doing already in China, like Xu Xiaoping has just said in the morning about the hookup of household registrations. I think if I ask the Chinese sitting in this room, not many of you have Beijing hookup, right? How many people here have a Beijing hookup? Hands up. And for you, you have a Beijing hookup and you studied in one of the universities in Beijing. That experience is very different from me who don't have a hookup and constantly thinking about the value or the protection of the rights I have as a migrant student, migrant worker, even you can argue that a high-end one, not a deed one, what is my rights as a migrant, internal ones in China? And then you can think about the migrants, the forced migrant refugees, global-wise. I think we need to appreciate that there is a inherent coexisting um, rationale there that's echoing with each other. Um, we need to think about that and then the international humanitarian efforts can be more um, like a grassroots, like a community level efforts can be more genuine and sincere and carrying forward. Could I come back on, on, on that point, Michael, and address you a bit more? When I was listening to what you had to say, it struck me that part of the debate going on is surely about the role of the state. Because if we're talking about the ecology of um, philanthropy and of assistance, both domestic and international, in, you know, let's say, the UK or in the United States, what has emerged, as you know better than I do, is a, an environment in which the state certainly plays a role. I mean, DFID in Britain is a good example of that. But there is a huge ecology of outfits that are genuinely grassroots. They've grown up. They often have relationships with the state, but um, they are not state organizations. The direction of travel has seemed in the last five or six years to go much more towards the state, party state, absorbing the efforts elsewhere. And I'm wondering, is that just a different model? Is it, can it be a successful model in its own right? Or is there a, is there a necessity for more space to breathe 
for those sorts of efforts so that they don't basically get snuffed out before they um, actually develop and, and grow? Can the state do everything, in other words? I don't believe the state can do everything. That's why I mean, it's a society of uh, industry, let's say. Mm. But I'm not sure about that in the current China mode where the state is pretty much doing everything and trying to grab more uh, into its hands. Which way should we take in the future? We do uh, have or try to have a dialogue with the states, with the authorities, without giving up much of our independence, without giving much of our voice. Sometimes there's a criticism against the states, but sometimes it's also trying to have a dialogue with them to have our agenda in, in, into their agendas. But I'm, I'm not sure about it yet, but I do think that there is much to be learned in the experience of the Europe in the future in China. I think there's a lot of that is the interactions of the people, people in the states or people in the civil societies. They need to have that interaction with each other. I think that is very much um, needed in the China in the future. Okay, perhaps we'll just have one last thought on that, Suzanne, before we go to our, our audience. But soft power is something we've discussed in previous Oxford China forums. I'm not sure the term is specifically on the program, but it's always out there somewhere. And again, when I think, talk to Chinese policymakers and think tankers, and you've sp spoken to a lot more than I ever have, it continues to be a sort of continuing uh, theme in terms of what they want to do. Now, this idea of international um, development, the idea of refugee assistance, I mean, all of this actually is something that China has a historical connection with. I, I'm a, really a specialist on the Second World War period. And I've been doing work which I found fascinating about the way in which China sought to reconstruct itself after World War II, between 1945 and 49, in which the United Nations played a role, but also China's own ideas from Chinese tradition and Chinese history were brought in after one of the worst refugee crises in, in history. So it's not as if China doesn't know about this uh, when it chooses to, to, to do so. But in the end, I don't hear much of a discourse at the moment in terms of Chinese international relations thinking about how to operationalize things like international you know, refugee assistance as a way of really giving China that sense that it's a cooperative international act. You hear the language quite often, but putting it into practice, it comes up against the idea, well, this goes into political areas that we find uncomfortable. Is there a balance to be found there, or is it too hard to square that circle? I don't think it's a, a square hard to circle at all um, for the following sort of reasons. I mean, talking about the, again, back to the uh, conception of shared uh, community, uh, common com community of uh, shared destination, it is written into the UNHR uh, Human Rights Council, actually, in mm -hmm. 2017. It's also written into one of the UN resolutions about outer space um, control, arms control, 2017, I think. Uh, talk about Back to sort of more generally on soft power, um, China, the government again, state uh, leading uh, kind of led activities approaching, promoting soft power all over the world of China. And I think uh, commentators tended to say we need to bring that core more expli explicit to, to the surface. I guess that's what uh, uh, many analysts, you know, political, political theorists and the philosophers are working on. I don't want to really refer to Zhao Pinyang's or on the heaven concept because in a way it has uh, stirred up a lot of uh, suspicion about mm. is China returning to the pre-modern era. But if you look at the very concept of connectivity, for instance, which is pretty much in the BRI initiative, mm. um, talking about refugee and other, I, I think the, in the Confucian traditions, very much at it, as a universal sort of language, China deeply uh, um, assigned onto all these sort of efforts. I mean, of course, you can say they, they, they tend to prioritize Chinese nationals, I mean, uh, protect them. But uh, the spirit of, you know, saving strangers and the responsibility to protect, mm -hmm. these are not, the Chinese participate in engineering that norm in the UN. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's the, the, the any sort of disparity. I guess the language is a major thing we need to work on. Very good point. And Germany, of course, two years ago, took a million Syrian refugees. How many do you think China should take? <laughs> Hard question. I know the figure is that how many China actually has taken. Last year, the refugees settled by the UNHCR in Beijing, 724. So maybe some space to add one or two more in there as well. And add to diversity as well, which is always a, a plus. Let's turn to our audience here as well, who are going to be, I think, the generation who will actually be um, implementing some of these ideas. I mean, yes. did you want to take the questions, uh, Woody? Go for it. Um, 
Well, what we are going to do is to take two questions at a time. So would you mind um, raise your hand? Uh, the gentleman over here, and uh, could we have the lady? Uh, also, gentleman over. Oh, okay, lady over there. Uh, so, uh, lady first. Ladies first. Thank you. Could you speak up? Uh, uh, I can't hear very could well. you please? Thank you. And gentlemen over here, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, just a, as a very friendly reminder, please make two, maybe you have a lot of questions, just make it one, okay. Thank you very much. And now, uh, shall we have uh, Mr. Liu? Thank you very much for your question on the issue of the um, refugee convention. As a lawyer, I can assure you that the law always have a problem. And this is very much true for international law. So no matter which uh, convention we're talking about, which topic we're talking about, we always have a problem. And that's why we have lawyers. That's why we get paid to handle those problems. I think the, the, uh, the issue is for China is not really, is it better to be without that convention because it's not perfect? People violate the law and trying to find justifications of it because the law is there. The law can be always better. Does not mean that there won't be anyone violating the law. The role for China, I think, is not to rewrite the law, but to develop the existing concept. Rewrite the law is always, it's time consuming to work with 194 states to have something new. Um, what I, we do have a discussion in China three year, two years ago, actually, in Shanghai. I very much comment to, um, echoes what um, Professor Murano was saying, we talk about China's experience of accepting the refugees in the World Two, in the World War Two. Um, there was only one state around the globe openly accepting the Jewish refugees in Shanghai. Right now, you have a museum there. You have a bunch of scholars who are um, researching on that experience. Why the Jewish 
all across Europe, settled in Shanghai, and flourished there. So the theory is that China is a very um, pro-development state, and they give the rights or the room for the development of the Jewish refugees in Shanghai, and that's one of the reasons they get prospered. So I think that might be a re that might be a role in the future for China to to um, to advance some of the agendas so is really to take the refugees not as a burden, but the opportunity for development. Thank you for the question. I leave it to you, Professor. Um, well, first of all, thank you for bringing up the question of the the May Fourth Movement. Uh, and many of you here will know that um, probably one of the key journals of the May Fourth Movement, that New Culture Movement of 99 years ago, which will celebrate its centenary next year. Uh, was the new youth, the Xin Qingyan. So I'm sure that all the Xin Qingyan who are here will no doubt be taking part in some kind of renaissance in years to come. Um, I would just say that one of the things, that in retrospect, it's clear that 100 years on, that that very important cultural movement and flowering of a century ago showed in China was the immense capacity that China's political and literary and cultural classes had to rethink their own society, to go really to the roots of what they thought was going wrong and what was going well, and try and work out how to offer in the most broad, cosmopolitan, free-thinking way possible new solutions. Some of them worked out, some of them didn't. But if you look at the way in which people thought during the May 4th movement, one of the most obvious things was the very wide range of free debates on all sorts of subjects, everything from relationships between men and women to the new kind of political settlement that China might have. So I would hope that on a May 4th centenary, which uh, I think we should try and celebrate, perhaps at next year's Oxford China Forum in uh, 2019, 100 years after 1919, um, it will give some substance to that idea of being able to rethink many assumptions rather than closing in, looking out and making sure that new solutions are always tried, debated and contested and then put forward. Thank you very much. Now shall we have Gentlemen. Suzanne maybe wants to come in yes. on, on something. Uh, uh, the, the, the second one. Sovereignty? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. that's right. I have to talk about Germany. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, China's sovereignty. Yeah. Um, yes, that was directed to you, but I uh, have a brief sort of uh, comment. Um, I think China, UK, um, as you can see in the media report, has entered into what's called a golden era, right? I mean, you know, uh, UK is a member of AIB, and also uh, the former uh, Prime Minister is working on the sort of infrastructure fund to work with BRI uh, initiative. Uh, you can see uh, China has been um, quite engaging, and so have been some officials. I mean, the uh, extra uh, checker, uh, what's his name, Mon. What's his name? I don't remember the ex Hammond. Hammond, yes. Hammond. He was at the uh, BRI summit last May, and they've taken very positive attitudes towards it. And I think there will be, in the foreseeable future, I would uh, you know, anticipate lots of cooperation 
And I think, again, mechanisms of um, bilateral relations uh, is very, very important. They need to engage and have dialogue and to come up uh, with uh, uh, solutions that both are uh, happy about. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I'm very happy to hear your comments. And um, in, in this, we do disagree with each other on that. There's no doubt. I think if we were looking to the, the, some of the, well, let's look into the United Nations Charter. I think it does left some room for the regionalism. The idea is that we have a world, and the world is not based only on the different sovereign states, but also based on different regions. And if you have a regional organizations play a more powerful role, like a European Union, African Union, or Arab States Unions, that could be the pillar of the global system. In that way, I think that's the global re globalism, where it, it doesn't start from scratch. It started from somewhere. We have sort of in integrations in the regional level, in the European level, and then we have a model or we have more possibilities for globalism, for, for the international um, integrations. And if you, from the, if you look from the European perspective, the European countries have been trying very hardly to make the globalization based on the European model. I'm not advocating for that. And lots of the Chinese policies are against that as well. It's not perfect, but Europe has a future, has a vision for the future. They have a European Union, they have a European Court, they have a European Court of Human Rights, and they're trying to make the states have that element as well. In that sense, I'm saying the left, the, the Brexit itself, living the European Union, is a strike of the existing efforts. It might create a different dynamics, as Professor Rana said, with British character, it might succeed in that as well, but I, in, I for one, vote for the existing ones. Thank you. And I'll give brief work. just on that, as I said, don't call it Brexit, call it Europeanisation with British characteristics, and you then start a different sort of dialogue. And my more serious point was, regardless of what you think, yes or no, about Brexit, and I was very careful, I hope, not to be saying that we should think positively or negatively about the vote, thinking about issues like security, about the use of international aid to try and create a new sort of idea of community, these are conversations that the UK and its partners, and you know we are partners still with Europe, we're not enemies, um, need to start happening now and probably amongst your generation as well. So it really that's a plea for people to start a new conversation in which China is very much a factor. On the term limits question, what I'd say is at one level, of course, lots of countries, including the UK, don't have term limits on their leaders. But I think there is a very particular issue which I hope will be addressed in the context of Chinese politics. One of the things that was done over the last 25 to 30 years when the constitutional amendment was put in that the presidency should be limited to two five-year terms was to argue that this was a means of regularizing Chinese politics. Chinese politics, bless its heart, is not always very transparent at the best of times. It's always fascinating, but it's often hard to know how to get to the bottom of it. And this was one of the sort of fixed points that one had, that knowing that there would be a cycle of peaceful renewal of leadership uh, in that sense. If something else is coming in its place, well, that could be acceptable too, but we need to know more about what it is. So we're hoping that this is not the end of that statement. Instead, it's the start of a bigger discussion, maybe at the Lianghui, you know, the NPC and so forth, later this, um, uh, this week, uh, next week, um, in which discussions of other ways in which predictable and reliable understandings of the dynamics of Chinese politics are changing. That would be a dialogue very, very well worth happening, and I hope it you know, is something that we all get to hear more about, not just within closed circles um, in, in Beijing. Thank you. Now, um, shall we? What's back? And back. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, yes, yes. Chinese civilians, did you say? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, that's the first question. 
Shall we have? Okay. Thank you very much. Now, because of time is almost running out, uh, we should take one more question, and then our distinguished speakers will answer it very, very briefly. So, um, shall we have someone sitting? Anyone who would like to ask a question? Okay, you please. Yes. <laughs> The answer to your question, um, I constantly have to think about it because I'm the one founder of the organization. I have to do fundraise all the time. I need to ask people why you care. And I think the answer is quite simple because we want to be good people. We want to be good people, therefore, we care about others. It's one thing that we don't know about the fate of someone else, but when you read about it, you as a mother, you as, as, as someone has experienced some difficulties, you want to help. I think that is common when I read about an uh, organization who started from here, the Oxfam, um, very global organization now, but it started from here in Oxford County. They were thinking about the same. They, they, they think they are committed citizens. They think they have responsibilities. They want to do something, therefore, to get started. I think that's the same. But also, there is also... Um, Let's say there's more cynical part of myself. How can I be successful when I'm appealing to people? I think in China, well, I lived in Cambodia before, in a Southeast Asia country, a size of Asia in terms of population, and also in Europe, in Netherlands, where I have an office. Both of these countries, one in the West, one in the third world, are very small compared to China. What I found the most different is we Chinese think we are citizens of a very big country. Therefore, we have to do more. Something like that. This mentality of big state, where the Taiwanese always joke about, um, I think that works on different levels. Really, we think because we believe we have come, a, come from a very old civilization, we're going to be the world power, if not already one. We have more responsibilities um, in that. Therefore, we need to do more. I hope that answered your question. Thank Just you. Very briefly, I'd like to draw attention to a distinction between uh, sort of normative belief, belief and behavior norm. I mean, we talk about values, for instance. I mean, lots of the discussion is about okay, what China actually believes. I mean, it's very difficult to tap into that. What does China mean here? I mean, are we talking about intellectuals? Are we talking about the top leaders? Are we talking about general public? It's very, very sophisticated issues to, to deal with. But if we talk about uh, words and deeds to an extent they match, one can say okay, not all states always have these two matched, but uh, um, that's, that's just political uh, life, part of uh, international um, politics. But if you take a very serious approach, looking at China's sort of belief system, if you took a look at how serious uh, the top leadership currently are engaging with the sort of Confucianist sort of ideas, destination being one, harmony being one, you realize if you look at Compare them with Western philosophy, for instance, you will see they're not necessarily always on the same level. They may be just behavior norms rather than deep beliefs. So I think uh, when we talk about Chinese values coming more explicit to the surface, whether you know, project the soft power all over the world in one way or another, uh, I guess this is something we need to engage. I still think philosophers need to do a lot of work, actually. Yes, I mean, I, I look forward to the panel in the afternoon. But back to IR, very briefly, uh, I think it's to <coughs> check, again, the rule of thumb is always checking what China is doing. 
uh, against what it's saying, you will see a lot of these things are very practical. It's common sense approach. Yeah. And I'll finish in one, your excellent question, I'll answer just really in one or two sentences. I think there is no doubt that there is an immense hunger, there is an immense hunger in the West and in Britain for further understanding of Chinese culture and civilization, both in the longer term and more immediately. If you look at the kind of cues that went for the sellout exhibition on the Ming Dynasty at the British Museum just a couple of years ago, that's just one example. There's plenty of others in which it's clear that understanding more about China as an immensely important country and society is really uh, part of that. What I would add, though, is very important is that further understanding comes not just from dialogue, which is a term we hear a lot about, but also about debate. And therefore, as China seeks to be better understood in the West, and the West seeks to be better understood in China, both sides will find that there are areas where they have points of agreement and points of convergence, and many points on which they will disagree. And you know what? Disagreement is fine. It's part of dialogue and discourse as well. And as long as both sides understand that and take those discussions forward in a free and frank point of view, I think no fundamental uh, problem is there. But both sides have to understand that that's part of the process as well. And if so, then you will get eventually a very fruitful sort of dialogue between both sides. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for attending this event. And let's give a very, very warm applause to all of us.